of modern physics is important. According to the classical, uniquely serial, view of time, too contemporary. Actual entities define the same actual world. According to the modern view, 66, discussions and applications. No two actual entities define the same actual world. Actual entities are called contemporary when neither belongs to the given actual world defined by the other. The differences between the actual worlds of a pair of contemporary entities, which are in a certain sense neighbors, are negligible for most human purposes. Thus THC difference between the classical and the relativity view of time only rarely has any important relevance. I shall always adopt the relativity view, for one reason, because it seems better to accord with the general philosophical doctrine of relativity which is presupposed in the philosophy of organism, and for another reason, because with rare exceptions the classical doctrine can be looked on as a special case of the relativity doctrine a case which does not seem to accord with experimental evidence. In other words, the classical view seems to limit a general philosophical doctrine, it is the larger assumption, and its consequences, taken in conjunction with other scientific principles, seem to be false. 103 e. The second metaphysical assumption is that the real potentialities relative to all standpoints are coordinated as diverse determinations of one extensive continuum. This extensive continuum is one relational complex in which all potential objectifications find their niche. It underlies the whole world, past, present, and future. Considered in its full generality, apart from the additional conditions proper only to the cosmic epoch of electrons, protons, molecules, and star systems, the properties of this continuum are very few and do not include the relationships of metrical geometry. An extensive continuum is a complex of entities united by the various allied relationships of whole to part, and of overlapping so as to possess common parts, and of contact, and of other relationships derived from these primary relationships. The notion of a continuum involves both the property of indefinite divisibility and the property of unbounded extension. There are always entities beyond entities, because non-entity is no boundary. This extensive continuum expresses the solidarity of all possible standpoints throughout the whole process of the world. It is not a fact prior to the world, it is the first determination of order that is, of real potentiality arising out of the general character of the world. In its full generality beyond the present epoch, it does not involve shapes, dimensions, or measurability, these are additional determinations of real potentiality arising from our cosmic epoch. This extensive continuum is real because it expresses a fact derived from the actual world and concerning the contemporary actual world. All actual entities are related according to the determinations of this continuum, and all possible actual entities in the future must exemplify these determinations in their relations with the already actual world. The reality of the future is bound up with the reality of this continuum. It is the reality of what is potential, in its character of a real component of what is actual. Such a real component must be interpreted in 104 terms of the the extensive continuum. 67 Relatedness of Prehension This task will be undertaken in Chapter 5 of Part 4 of these lectures.
actual entities atomize the extensive continuum. This continuum is in itself merely the potentiality for division, an actual entity affects this division. The objectification of the contemporary world merely expresses that world in terms of its potentiality for subdivision and in terms of the mutual perspectives which any such subdivision will bring into real effectiveness. These are the primary governing data for any actual entity, for they express how all actual entities are in the solidarity of one world. With the becoming of any actual entity what was previously potential in the space-time continuum is now the primary real phase in something actual. For each process of concrescence a regional standpoint in the world, defining a limited potentiality for objectification has been adopted. In the mere extensive continuum there is no principle to determine what regional quanta shall be atomized, so as to form the real perspective standpoint for the primary data constituting the basic phase in the concrescence of an actual entity. The factors in the actual world whereby this determination is effective will be discussed at a later stage of this investigation. They constitute the initial phase of the else objective aim. This initial phase is a direct derivate from God's primordial nature. In this function, as in every other, God is the organ of novelty, aiming at intensification. In the mere continuum there are contrary potentialities. In the actual world there are definite atomic actualities determining one coherent system of real divisions throughout the region of actuality. Every actual entity in its relationship to other actual entities is in this sense somewhere in the continuum, and arises out of the data provided by this standpoint. But in another sense it is everywhere throughout the continuum, for its constitution includes the objectifications of the actual world and thereby includes the continuum, also the 105 potential objectifications of itself contribute to the real potentialities whose solidarity the continuum expresses. Thus the continuum is present in each actual entity, and each actual entity pervades the continuum. This conclusion can be stated otherwise. Extension, apart from its spatialization and temporalization, is that general scheme of relationships providing the capacity that many objects can be welded into the real unity of one experience. Thus, an act of experience has an objective scheme of extensive order by reason of the double fact that its own perspective standpoint has extensive content, and that the other actual entities are objectified with the retention of their extensive relationships. These extensive relationships are more fundamental than their more special spatial and temporal relationships. Extension is the most general scheme of real potentiality, providing the background for all other organic relations. The potential scheme does not determine its own atomization by actual entities. It is divisible, but its real division by actual entities depends upon. 68. Discussions and Applications more particular characteristics of the actual entities constituting the antecedent environment. In respect to time, this atomization takes the special form two of the ethical theory of time. In respect to space, it means that every actual entity in the temporal world is to be credited with a spatial volume for its perspective standpoint. These conclusions are required by the consideration of Zeno's arguments, in connection with the presumption that an actual entity is an act of experience. The authority of William James can be quoted in support of this conclusion. He writes, Either your experience 
appearances of no content, of no change, or it is of a perceptible amount of content or change. Your acquaintance with reality grows literally by buds or drops of perception. Intellectually and on reflection you can divide these into components, but as immediately given, 106 they come totally or not at all. 4 James also refers to Zeno. In substance I agree with his argument from Zeno, though I do not think that he allows sufficiently for those elements in Zeno's paradoxes which are the product of inadequate mathematical knowledge. But I agree that a valid argument remains after the removal of the invalid parts. The argument, so far as it is valid, elicits a contradiction from the two premises, I that in a becoming something res vera becomes, and e that every act of becoming is divisible into earlier and later sections which are themselves acts of becoming. Consider, for example, an act of becoming during one second. The act is divisible into two acts, one during the earlier half of the second, the other during the later half of the second. Thus that which becomes during the whole second presupposes that which becomes during the first half second. Analogously, that which becomes during the first half second presupposes that which becomes during the first quarter second, and so on indefinitely. Thus if we consider the process of becoming up to the beginning of the second in question, and ask what then becomes, no answer can be given. For, whatever creature we indicate presupposes an earlier creature which became after the beginning of the second and antecedently to the indicatec creature. Therefore there is nothing which becomes, so as to effect a transition into the second in question. The difficulty is not evaded by assuming that something becomes at each non-extensive instant of time. For at the beginning of the second of time there is no next instant at which something can become. Zeno in his, arrow in its flight, seems to have had an obscure grasp of this argument. But the introduction of motion brings in irrelevant details. The true difficulty is to understand how the arrow survives the lapse of 2 cf. My Science and the Modern World, ch. 7. A CF, Loco CIT, and Part 4 of the present work. For some problems of philosophy, chx, my attention was drawn to this passage by its quotation in Religion and Thet Philosophy of William James, by Professor J. S. Fixler. The Extensive Continuum, 69, Time, 107 Unfortunately Descartes' treatment of endurance is very superficial, and subsequent philosophers have followed his example. In his, Achilles and the Tortoise, Zeno produces an invalid argument depending on ignorance of the theory of infinite convergent numerical series. Eliminating the irrelevant details of the race and of motion details which have endeared the paradox to the literature of all ages consider the first half second as one act of becoming, the next quarter second is another such act, the next eighth second is yet another, and so on indefinitely. Zeno then illegitimately assumes this infinite series of acts of becoming can never be exhausted. But there is no need to assume that an infinite series of acts of becoming, with a first act, and each act with an immediate successor, T is inexhaustible in the process of becoming. Simple arithmetic assures us that the series just indicated will be exhausted in the period of one second. The way is then open for the intervention of a new act of becoming which lies beyond the whole series.
Thus this paradox of Zeno is based upon a mathematical fallacy. The modification of the arrow paradox stated above brings out the principle that every act of becoming must have an immediate successor if we admit that something becomes. For otherwise we cannot point out what creature becomes as we enter upon the second in question. But we cannot, in the absence of some additional premise, infer that every act of becoming must have had an immediate predecessor. The conclusion is that in every act of becoming there is the becoming of something with temporal extension, but that the act itself is not extensive, in the sense that it is divisible into earlier and later acts of becoming which correspond to the extensive divisibility of what has become. In this section, the doctrine is enunciated that the creature is extensive, but that its act of becoming is not extensive. This topic is resumed in part. IV. How LOA ever. Some anticipation of parts 3 and IV is now required. The res vera, in its character of concrete satisfaction, is divisible into prehensions which concern its first temporal half and into prehensions which concern its second temporal half. This divisibility is what constitutes its extensiveness. But this concern with a temporal and spatial sub-region means that the datum of the prehension in question is the actual world, objectified with the perspective due to that sub-region. A prehension, however, acquires subjective form, and this subjective form is only rendered fully determinate by integration with conceptual prehensions belonging to the mental pole of the res vera. The concrescence is dominated by a subjective aim which essentially concerns the creature as a final superject. This subjective aim is this subject of self determining its own self creation as one creature. Thus the subjective aim does not share in this divisibility. If we confine attention to prehensions concerned with the earlier half, their subjective forms have arisen from nothing. For the subjective aim which belongs to the whole is now excluded. Thus the evolution of subjective form could not be referred to any actuality. The ontological principle has been 70. Discussions and applications Violated. Something has floated into the world from nowhere. The summary statement of this discussion is that the mental pole determines the subjective forms and that this pole is inseparable from the total res vera. Section 3. The discussion of the previous sections has merely given a modern, take to the oldest of European philosophic doctrines. But as a doctrine of common sense, it is older still as old as consciousness itself. The most general notions underlying the words, space, and time, are those which this discussion has aimed at expressing in their true connection with the actual world. The alternative doctrine, which is the Newtonian cosmology, emphasize that 109's receptacle, theory of space-time, and minimize the factor of potentiality. Thus bits of space and time were conceived as being as actual as anything else, and as being, occupied, by other actualities which were the bits of matter. This is the Newtonian, absolute, theory of space-time, which philosophers have never accepted, though at times some have acquiesced. Newton's famous Scholium 5 to his first eight definitions in his Principia expresses this point of view with entire clearness. Hitherto I have laid down the definitions of such words as are less known, and explained the sense in which I would have them to be understood in the following discourse. I do not define time, space, place, 
and motion as being well known to all. Only I must observe that the vulgar conceive those quantities under no other notions but from the relation they bear to sensible objects. And thence arise certain prejudices, for the removing of which, it will be convenient to distinguish them into absolute and relative, true and apparent, mathematical and common. I. Absolute, true, and mathematical time, of itself, and from its own nature, flows equably without regard to anything external, and by another name is called duration, relative, apparent, and common time, is some sensible and external whether accurate or unequable measure of duration by that means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time, such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. 2. Absolute space in its own nature, and without regard to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative space is the movable dimension or measure of the absolute spaces, which our senses determine by its position to bodies, and which is vulgarly taken for a movable space. Absolute and relative space are the same in figure and magnitude, but they do not remain always numerically the same. IV. As the order of the parts of time is 110 immutable, so also is the order of the parts of space. Suppose those parts to be. 5 Andrew Mott's translation, New Edition Revised, London, 1803. The extensive continuum moved out of their places, and they will be moved if the expression may be allowed out of themselves. For times and spaces are, as it were, the places as well of themselves as of all other things. All things are placed in time as to order of succession, and in space as to order of situation. It is from their essence or nature that they are places, and that the primary places of things should be movable is absurd. These are, therefore, the absolute places, and translations out of those places are the only absolute motions. Now no other places are immovable but those that, from infinity to infinity, who all retain the same given positions one to another, and upon this account must ever remain unmoved, and who thereby constitute, what I call, a movable space. The causes by which true and relative motions are distinguished, one from the other, are the forces impressed upon bodies to generate motion. True motion is neither generated nor altered, but by some force impressed upon the body move, but relative motion may be generated or altered without any force I am pressed upon the body. For it is sufficient only to impress some force on other bodies with which the former is compared, that by their giving way, that relation may be changed, in which the relative rest or motion of this other body did consist. The effects which distinguish absolute from relative motion are, the forces of receding from the axis of circular motion. For there are no such forces in a circular motion purely relative, but, in a true and absolute circular mo. Tion, they are greater or less, according to the quantity of motion. Wherefore relative quantities are not the quantities themselves, whose names they bear, but those sensible measures of them either accurate or inaccurate which are commonly used instead of the maya. Sleuth quantities themselves. I. 71. Have quoted at such length from Newton's Scholium because this document constitutes the clearest most definite, and most influential statement among the 111 knowledgeable speculations of mankind, 
speculations of a type which first assumed scientific importance with the Pythagorean school preceding and inspiring Plato. Newton is presupposing four types of entities which he does not discriminate in respect to their actuality. For him minds are actual things, bodies are actual things, absolute durations of time are actual things, and absolute places are actual things. He does not use the word, actual, but he is speaking of matter of fact, and he puts them all on the same level in that respect. The result is to land him in a clearly expressed but complex and arbitrary scheme of relationships between spaces inter se, between durations inter se, and between minds, bodies, times and places, for the conjunction of them all into the solidarity of the one universe. For the purposes of science it was an extraordinarily clarifying statement, that is to say, for all the purposes of science within the next 200 years, and for most of its purposes since that period. But, as a fundamental statement, it lies completely open. 72. Discussions and Applications To Skeptical Attack and also, as Newton himself admits, diverges from common sense LLTHE vulgar conceive those quantities under no other notions but from the relation they bear to sensible objects. Kant only saved it by reducing it to the description of a construct by means of which, pure intuition, introduces an order for chaotic data, and for the schools of transcendentalists derived from Kant this construct has remained in the inferior position of a derivative from the proper ultimate substantial reality. For the it is an element in, appearance, and appearance is to be distinguished from reality. The philosophy of organism is an attempt, with the minimum of critical adjustment, to return to the conceptions of the vulgar. T in the first place, the discussion must fasten on the notion of a sensible object, to quote Newton's phrase. We may expand Newton's phrase, and state that the common sense of mankind conceives that all its notions ultimately refer to actual entities, or as Newton terms them, sensible objects. Newton, basing himself upon 112 current physical notions, conceived sensible objects to be the material bodies to which the science of dynamics applies. He was then left with the antithesis between sensible objects and empty space. Newton, indeed, as a private opinion, conjectured that there is a material medium pervading space. But he also held TNAT there might not be such a medium. For him the notion, empty space, that is, mere spatiality had sense, conceived as an independent actual existence, from infinity to infinity. In this he differed from Descartes. Modern physics sides with Descartes. It has introduced the notion of the physical field. Also the latest speculations tend to remove the sharp distinction between the occupied portions of the field and the unoccupied portion. Further, in these lectures CF, CH, 3 of part 2 a distinction is introduced not explicitly in the mind either of the vulgar or of Newton. This distinction is that between I an actual entity, E an enduring object, E a corpuscular society, I V a non-corpuscular society, V a non-social nexus. A non-social nexus is what answers to the notion of chaos. The extensive continuum is that general relational element in experience whereby the actual entity's experience, 
and that unit experience itself, are united in the solidarity of one common world. The actual entity...